Um, five weeks late, I was baptized. So, and we had to do five weeks. I wanted to do sooner, but they said they had to give us the lessons. So, I thought, okay, I'll let you do your job. I'm really eager, but I'll let you actually do what you're meant to do. And then, yeah. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Saints Unscripted. We're super happy to be here today. We are with our friend, Shane Wakenshaw, and I am so thrilled to be talking to you today. Shane, thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So Shane has has a pretty cool story. He lives currently in the UK. And where is it in the UK that you live right now? So it's a city called Newcastle, but a small village called North Shields. And it seems like every new missionary who comes in the mission tends to end up here at some point. So I'm sure plenty of people who are listening have probably been here. Oh, that's Quite awesome. Possibly. So uh, Shane has has watched our show for quite a while. And, and so we're really happy that that he's on here now. And um, anyway, so Shane, go ahead and just introduce yourself a little bit. Just tell us who you are, what you're up to. You married, have kids. What are you doing in life right now? Yeah, thank you. So yeah, I'm 29. I have been a member of the church since 2016. So I just celebrated celebrated for another right word but just had seven years as a member um i think that's a celebration wild yeah <laughs> I would, I, okay let's call it a celebration yeah because it definitely was a good thing that i joined the church so let's call it that um currently married have been since 2017 so funny enough i met my wife a month after joining the church and we got baptized a year to the day of meeting and a baptized married apologies a, a year to the day after we met so that's going on, no kids currently, but yeah, a little bit about me, I, I love to write, so I love to write like young adult fiction, historical fiction mainly, and just, I love that, it's really therapeutic. Really? And I've been the bishop of the ward I first stepped into for about eight months now, so that's also pretty wild, so a lot going on. That is wild. And I'm excited to talk more about that as well, you being the bishop of your ward, because it's only been seven years, right? That's... That's like not a yeah. lot of time. So starting your your journey of faith. Now I know that before you got to know the church, you definitely, I mean, from from the little I learned about you before this interview, you weren't really religious at all. You wanna tell us kind of just like where did this all start, I guess? You can start where you'd like. Yeah. It's a good question. So I never really had any experiences to make me believe there was a god or anything to believe in but i wasn't raised like anti-religious or anything we okay. definitely said god in the house like every night my mom when putting us to bed when we were kids would always say like god bless and stuff like that but we didn't really follow anything specific or kind of practice any religion um religion in school over here in england is actually really integrated so like you'll go to school or public school and it was always you would sing hymns and you would have some kind of christianity element to mm -hmm. you growing up but it was just sort of the thing you did you didn't really nobody really practiced it from what i remember it was just something you had to do at school more in tradition um, okay i think i mean my story is similar to what a lot of people who've been on the show have, have shared already in that they kind of lost sight of themselves and weren't really sure where they fit in or what they were supposed to do next in life and i went through a, a couple of tough years where i think on the outside people thought that I was fine. You know, I had friends, I had people around who I really cared about. Um, I did get involved in things I didn't really want to be involved in. So at the time I was smoking marijuana and I was drinking a lot. And I was kind of going down a, down a path that I never really wanted to go down. And I somehow found myself there. And a couple of months before I got baptized, a close personal friend passed away. And I remember being at their funeral and the vicar, I think it was, the minister was doing like a eulogy or they were saying a prayer. And I remember just thinking, if there was a God, why has this happened? And I remember being really, really embittered. And I think I was just at a really critical point in my life where there was, there was two roads and I didn't really know that at the time. I didn't really know any other path than the one I was already on. Mm -hmm. And it was November. I'd sort of left a friend's house after again smoking marijuana and 
I just had a feeling I need to get out of the house. I need to leave this house, leave this leave this environment right now and just and just go home. And that's when I met the missionaries. So I didn't meet them under the best frame of mind. But I'm really glad that I followed the prompting of the Holy Spirit, which at the time I didn't obviously know what that was. But clearly I had to leave and had to do that thing. Otherwise, I wouldn't have met them when I did. Yeah. So it was a pretty interesting time. Just, yeah, things weren't going well. And I was looking for, I don't know what I was looking for. I didn't even make a conscious decision to look for anything better. I just stumbled across it. Yeah, I think sometimes the timing does work out that way. Often the missionaries will find people when they are going through a hard time. Um, and so that's, I, I think that was probably meant to be in, in your case, right? Cause were you more, because you were going through this hard time, were you more, I guess, receptive to what they had to say or were yeah, you just kind of I mean, like, ah, I'm just going to talk to these guys, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing was like, they didn't even actually talk about anything religious. So oh, interesting. on the out and the sort of the, the, the outside why are they not talking about anything religious? It's the whole point of being there, but they clearly must have followed some kind of problem to not talk about that. So they were just really down to earth, normal, casual guys. I'll, I'll give them a little shout out in case they're listening because they are like brothers to me. So Elder Jacopo, who's Australian, and Elder Diaz, who's from Utah also. And they were just the best guys for me at that time. Like they just... They made jokes that were my kind of humor. Mm -hmm. They really sort of disarmed me because if they, I would have straight away, no, I'm not interested. I don't want to talk about that. That's not what I'm here for. And it was just, I met them at a bus stop. So they were waiting for the bus. I was waiting for the bus and they just made a joke. There was a little push scooter that had been abandoned in the bus stop and the bus was late and Elder Yarapo said, jump on the handlebars and we'll push you home. <laughs> and I thought, and in my head, I wanted to make the same joke. Like, I was desperate to make that exact same joke. And I thought, no yeah, way. It's my humor. <laughs> and then after about 10 minutes, I went, oh, you're wearing name tags? What are they? And they went, oh, we're just missionaries for the Church of Jesus Christ, the Black Day Saints. And then that's all that said. And they left it. And then went back to, like, sports and you know, hobbies and different things. And, yeah, I just felt something really good about them. Like, there was just something very different. And I felt like I'd known them for a long time. Mm. in the space of 10 minutes. So Wow. That's a that's a great first, I guess, meeting with, with someone who is a member. So after that, did they set an appointment with you or you just kind of saw them in passing again? How did that go forward? From memory, I feel like I set the appointment with them because in my mind, I was trying to treat it like a joke. But then I realized it wasn't so... We got on the bus. They were going to a dinner appointment um, to, at someone's house who lived on the same street as me, just like a couple of houses over, mm -hmm. which was really interesting. So Coincidence? I think not. Talk the whole time. <laughs> I know it's so weird because the person that were going to, to have tea at their house, they were supposed to pick them up, but something came up, so they couldn't make it, so they had to get the bus, and it was just really interesting. But anyway... Obviously, at this time, as I mentioned before, I was high. And to me, it was still kind of a joke. I was always like, wow, this is a really interesting experience. So I said, here's my phone number, here's my email, here's my address, here's everything. Get in touch whenever you want. We're scheduled an appointment the following week. I remember going home and saying to my best friend who I was living with at the time, what had happened and I kind of played it off as a joke I was saying oh I met these these Mormon missionaries can you believe it and they were like Whoa. and I said oh, I'm just going to string them along I'm just going to pretend I'm interested and kind of string them along and they said yeah please do it let's see what happens <gasps> so at the time me and my friends did that like we all kind of wanted to do the most outrageous thing to kind of top the other one I guess and I remember going into my room and I sat down and I instantly sobered up like I'd, I'd never sobered up that quickly before when I sat quietly on, on my bed and I just knew it wasn't a joke. And I felt this mo the most unbelievable feeling that I have felt since, which I can definitely recognize is the Holy Ghost. And it just really confirmed to me, this is not a joke, you need to continue doing this. So 
Mm. I went from that day being a pretty staunch atheist to by the night time, no one had to meet them again. And I'm pretty sure we met the next week. Um, five weeks later, I was baptized. So, and we had to do five weeks. I wanted to do sooner, but they said they had to give us the lessons. So I thought, okay, I'll let you do your job. I'm really eager, but I'll let you actually do what you're meant to do. And then, yeah, that was late November. And I got baptized, I think January 9th, around about there. So really quickly. Yeah. As you got to know the gospel, you know, you had that experience with God. Did the gospel just continue to sound right to you as you learned about the restoration and the plan of salvation and all those things? Um, was there any conflict in your mind as you continued to learn? Or was it just like, okay, this continues to feel right? Everything made sense, but my understanding of it was really lacking. So I was quite a difficult new member of the church just because it was all so alien. And anything alien to me, I was struggling to have as much of an open mind as I needed at the time. Mm -hmm. So if I heard something I didn't like, it would kind of be like, oh, why is that? That, You know, I don't agree with that. But my wife really helped me with that. And when we were dating, she would say, rather than getting up a height about something, actually think about it, pray about it, ponder it, research it, learn more. And then you'll save yourself having to go to 100 and then come back down again after a couple of days. Yeah. So that happened in time and I think I had nothing in my life to make me doubt what was being told because I didn't believe in anything so they were just trying to help me learn something new and I was open enough to want to know why they lived their life the way they did and why they seemed so happy because they had something in their life that seemed so different to mine they seemed to have their lives together and as I said I was at a place where I was really unhappy with where I was in life And even if I didn't fully believe or understand what they were teaching me at the time, I figured if I give it a bit of pinch of salt and I give it time and a bit of grace, then at some point it might make more sense to me. And it has, it it took a while, but I just wanted to let them do what they were here to do because I just had such a good energy with them. And there was something very different about them that I needed in my life. That's awesome. So now... You are the bishop of the ward seven years later. <laughs> how, yeah. how long have you been bishop? Or how did this, I, I guess, like, how did your story finish up until now? Yeah, it, it was interesting because when I converted, as I said before, I didn't really have a testimony of God or Jesus Christ or anything really. I just, I loved the fellowship aspect of the church. Like, I was taken in very early by a member of our ward. It would treat me like her own, and we had family home, even at her house. Like when I was investigating the church, like she was so good, and she just treated me so well. And we're still super close now. And she was a lifeline to me because I didn't really have a safe space to learn about the gospel or the restored gospel, I should say. Um, and yeah, so I had had her. Who she, you know, she was really, really helpful, and she massively influenced me in in sort of joining the church and feeling comfortable. And I remember at the time thinking, the love these people are showing for me isn't natural. Like this love can only come from a higher place. Mm-hmm. And that was my first converting experience because I, I was like, why do these people love me as much as they do? Like nobody loves me this much. I just didn't understand why they cared, and I, that was my first sort of little little nibble of the gospel and of having a testimony because that just it was something different that I I love had to come from like I said a a much higher place and I joined the church I was a bit of a wishy-washy member like I didn't really commit to anything I kind of came last minute before sacrament started left straight away like I wasn't really engaged but I went to YSA for an activity that I really didn't want to go but my then eldest co president said, I'm outside your house, so we're going. <laughs> so I kind of didn't, <laughs> well, I couldn't say no to that. So I got in the car, went up, and my wife, at the time, she was the uh, YSA rep. And I remember walking in the room and just thinking, wow, okay, I like her. There we go. And <laughs> that's so took, cool. a, took her a bit of time to warm to me. You know, I, wo- I warmed to her very quickly, but took her you know, a couple of months to warm to me. And luckily she said yes to to a date and like I said we got married pretty much a year later so that was really exciting and I think my real conversion story came a couple of years into the church as being a member and I, cause like I said I loved writing I loved doing different things and different activities and I remember it was during lockdown 
during COVID. And I was walking around the same street, because in England you could go for one walk a day, and it was this, pretty much the same walk every day that we did for months. <laughs> and I was thinking, okay, on Mondays I can do writing, on Tuesdays I can do this, on Wednesday I can do a bit of scripture, on Thursday I can, I can you know, do this. And I thought, why am I trying to fit the gospel around everything else? I've made this life-changing experience. I've lost friends, you know, family have been unhappy with the decision and right be so it came more overnight, so I totally understand. And I thought I need to send the gospel and everything else needs to fit around that. And if it doesn't fit and it drops off, that's okay. Because mm-hmm. the most important thing is being followed. And since then I kind of feel like I've got a real fire in my belly, I guess. Um because and now and have done for the past few years really felt that converting experience and it just came a little bit later. So for anybody who is looking to take lessons or wants to ask questions about the church and, you know, they feel like they're being pressured for baptism day or they feel like they don't know enough to actually make that commitment, it's okay. Like, take it day at a time, step by step, because you don't need to know the, the full picture. Like, you don't need to have the full cake. You can literally have the tiniest slither and that can be enough to get you started. And it, it was for me. And yeah, um, Paul is bishop back in July. So that was really interesting. I'm from a small ward, so it's a family ward. And it's very, very strange being a bishop over the people who I look up to. Yeah, That's the ward really you weird. first converted in. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. Is, that is probably the weirdest thing. Like the, the people who I always go to for advice mm-hmm. are suddenly saying, even as a joke, oh, boss, or <laughs> they're coming to me and saying things and I'm going, I I don't feel comfortable in this dynamic change. It's really unusual. Yeah. Um, Yeah. That's awesome. Well, you know, I, I love your story because it illustrates that while all of us have a very different conversion journey, um, as far as a timeline for some, it, it takes, you know, some are just like, Oh yeah, this doctrine is totally it. And they join others. It's so different for everyone. But for you, what really carried you through was the fellowshipping that you had with these people. You were experiencing the fruits of the gospel, which are a people who love, a people who fellowship yeah. and, and welcome others, which is so, so important in in this church and in this gospel. So as one final question for you, what advice would you have for, I mean, we have a big audience of missionaries. What advice would you have for missionaries perhaps who are out uh, teaching right now um, and for members of the church who are also still ministering and being missionaries? What advice would you have for them? It's a really great question. And I think I'd be remiss in just saying, like how grateful I am to actually be able to have the opportunity to to share my story so far and to, and to speak to this audience. And it was actually a, an active missionary currently still well, on his mission who told me about saints and scripted and kept talking about it so often. And oh. little shout out because he's still on his mission, Elder Bevan, great guy, love him, excellent missionary and a really good friend. And... He put me onto this, and over the past few months, I've just digested so much of the content on this podcast. And what's always stood out is the real open and honest and vulnerable stories. And to me, my thoughts on this would be, don't rule anybody out. Wherever you're teaching, whether there's somebody who's on the records and they haven't been to church in 20 years, whether it's somebody you've met on the street and they've asked for an appointment, whether it's somebody who... You turn up and the smell of drugs or the drunk don't rule anybody out. If God is willing to work with me, I promise he's willing to work with everybody that you come in contact with. As you go about being or attempting to be a tool in the Lord's hands and and to bring bring to pass his work that he has planned for you and for the souls that you're teaching, miracles can happen. I never expected that within a month to two months time I would join a church. At the time, it was really scary. You know, my friends, family were really against it, but I totally appreciate why it it was sudden. And I can see why that was scary for them. A lot of people you're teaching and speaking to will be going through the same thing. To a missionary, 
conversion is what you expect to do. You expect to go and baptize people and you kind of give them these lessons and expect them to commit to that. But please remember, it's a life-changing experience and their whole world, their entire reality will change dramatically for the better. But it's, it's a really scary or no in time. So please don't rule anybody out. Please don't doubt yourself when you have a prompting as well from the spirit to act differently. Had my missionaries who helped me feel so loved, had they not have followed that prompting, and had they have just approached me, where missionaries, would you like lessons or would you like to talk about the gospel? I would not have been interested and I wouldn't have had the life that I've had now. But they followed the prompting that they knew they had to, to be able to reach me and to bring the gospel into my life. So, yeah. That was so well said. Thank you, Shane, for sharing your story and for that advice. Um, don't rule anyone out. I think that is just such an important reminder. So thank you for coming on our show. Everyone, please let us know um, in the comments if you have questions for Shane um, or if you have had experiences that you'd like to share too. Thank you for watching. And um, Shane, we're really glad that you've been on the show with us again. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, everyone like, subscribe, follow our channel if you haven't yet. And we love you all and we'll see you next time.